Lincoln. I uh, joined Ceres as a postdoc back in January, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you all about um, the hydrology research in Greenland that I've been a part of for um, the last uh, eight years or so. Um, and I was adding it up yesterday for this presentation, and I think I've been to Greenland over a dozen times now. Um, my first trip was uh, was back in July of 2012, and the most recent trip, uh, my, my most recent trip to Greenland was uh, last October. So I wanted to start off with a map that looks like this, which is a map uh, from Google Maps. Um, we have Greenland here in, in the middle, for those of you that aren't familiar. Uh, we have Canada over here, and uh, Iceland's right over here, and um, Scandinavia here. Um, now, I don't know about you all, but I use Google Maps all the time. Uh, I use it when I'm in a new place and I need to figure out how to get around. Uh, I use it to find information for different restaurants close by. I use it for all sorts of different things. Um, and one of the really cool things about Google Maps is that you can switch between a map view like this and a satellite view, which looks something like this. So this is a, this is a, a static satellite image of, of Greenland. Um, and one of the interesting things about this satellite image is that, uh, is that no matter what time of day or year, or what season you look at this, you look at this map, um, it always looks the same. So there's no clouds, uh, it's always daylight. Um, but in reality, there's a lot going on at the ground level that you might not see from this perspective. So, for example, during the summer, when temperatures are above freezing and days are long, almost 24 hours of daylight, um, the ice sheet around the periphery of Greenland starts to melt. Um, and areas that tend to melt each summer, year after year after year, are shown here in, in, uh, in red. Um, now, if we zoom in on an area like, like this star here um, during, the, during the summer melt season, uh, you might find something that looks like this. Well, what is this? It's, it's a huge network of lakes and rivers that cover miles and miles and miles of the ice surface. And these lakes and rivers are full of meltwater, all of which comes from melting of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, the lakes or melt ponds, as they're sometimes called, can look something like this. Uh, and the rivers, the meltwater filled rivers, can look something like this. Um, these are often called superglacial streams or superglacial rivers, superglacial meaning they're on top of the ice. Uh, this one flows here from the bottom of our screen to the top of the screen. Uh, and much of the rivers, just like, just much like rivers of, um, much like streams and rivers on land, these streams and rivers on the ice can be wide or they can be narrow. Uh, they can flow fast or they can flow slow. Uh, they can sometimes cover very short distances and they can sometimes flow tens of miles across the ice surface. Um, these rivers can drain directly off of the ice sheet into other streams and rivers, which run across narrow strips of coastline uh, that uh, surround parts of Greenland. Um, areas like this are home to animals like Arctic hares and Arctic foxes and caribou or reindeer, as they're called, and muskox uh, and polar bears, uh, and even in some parts of Greenland, even wolves. Um, now, these superglacial streams and rivers can also drain directly into the ocean. So this is a photo taken from a helicopter uh, in northwest Greenland, and you can see here there's a large river flowing across the ice, um, and the ice ends here, and there's some sea ice here, and the, the river terminates right here, uh, and then out here is some open ocean. Um, so this is a river that flows directly off of the ice into the ocean. Uh, and this river happens to be one of my favorites, in part because it drains into the ocean where there's a bunch of narwhals. Um, superglacial streams and rivers can also drain directly into the ice sheet, into a feature that's called a moulin. So right up here, you can see that this river ends right here, um, and it's draining into the ice and in, in, into a moulin. Uh, here's another picture of a moulin. Uh, you can see the turquoise blue meltwater racing through this river and going straight into the ice here. Um, and you can see that on the other side of this moulin, downstream of this, the river is now completely dry. It used to flow here and then a moulin opened up and now the water is going straight into the ice. And once the water enters the ice, it can refreeze in or below the ice. It can be stored within or below the ice, or it can make its way through and below the ice where it will come rushing out from beneath the glacier at the ice edge. So my research is interested in where, how, when, and how much meltwater travels across, through, and beneath, and eventually leaves the ice on its way to the ocean. Um, in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, what doing glacier hydrology fieldwork in Greenland is like. 
Um, and second, I want to briefly discuss why studying ice sheet hydrology is important. Um, now, there's lots of reason that ice sheet hydrology is important, but today I think, I think I'm only going to talk about one of the big reasons. So, how do you get to Greenland and what is working in Greenland like? Well, if you're a scientist that's coming from the US and you're doing research in Greenland, you probably catch a ride on a plane that looks something like this. And in case it wasn't obvious from that last photo, these planes are really big and they can carry lots of equipment and people and gear. Um, and when we first get to Greenland, we usually spend a few days in a warehouse where we sort and pack all of our gear and our science equipment um, and our food and everything that we're going to need. Uh, we also retest our science equipment to make sure that it all still works after being shipped from the United States. Um, and we double and triple check that we have everything we need because where we're going, there's no people, there's no stores, um, there's, there's, nothing that, there's nothing that we can do, or there's nowhere that we can go to buy things that we might need. So we have to make sure we bring it all with us. And then once we're done packing, we load everything up into trucks and drive it to the airport. Uh, we then weigh it all and we pack it on these cargo nets here. And then the helicopter comes and it picks up all of our stuff um, and it carries it underneath itself for miles and miles and miles across land and up onto the ice sheet to where we've decided to set up our camps. So this is an image of one of our camps that we set up on the ice sheet a few summers ago. Uh, you can see there's a big lake here in the middle with a bunch of rivers and streams that drain into it. And then there's a river that drains out of the lake here and runs into, into a moulin down here at the, the left of the screen. Um, and if you look in this white box here, you start to see some orange dots. And if we zoom in on this area, you can see that these orange dots are tents from our camp. Uh, this specific camp, we had six people at it, um, and we were camped out for uh, just under two weeks, I think. Um, this cluster of this cluster of, uh, of tents is the tents that we slept in. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you like camping, but camping on ice sheets uh, has some kind of unique challenges. Uh, for example, at this time of year in Greenland, uh, the ice sheet in this area melts quite a bit. So we have to move our tents pretty frequently to prevent puddles from forming underneath them and getting all of our stuff wet. Uh, this tent over here was our cook tent. Um, it it looked, looked like this on the inside. Uh, you can see we have a stove here for, for boiling water. And then there's some boxes here that have our food and other things in them. Um, we like to eat freeze-dried meals. Uh, we always buy this, this brand called Mountain House um, because we think they taste really good. And then they're complete meals and they come in a bag. All you have to do in order to prepare them is to boil some water and pour the water in the bag and seal it up and let it sit for a few minutes. Um, and they're really convenient for us because if you've been working for a long day, you don't really want to cook a long meal. And the other nice thing about them is all the only, the only dishes that you need to bring is a spoon because everything else you just eat inside the bag. So if it's cold, you don't really have to do any dishes. All you have to do when you're done eating is clean your spoon. Um, at this camp, we designated this little stream uh, right next to our cook tent as the place that we would get our drinking and our cooking water, uh, which is actually quite important because over here, this was the bathroom tent, and we had to make sure that if anything drained from the bathroom tent, that it would drain a different direction than from the cook tent. Uh, this over here was our work tent, and uh, we needed this because during this camp, we split up into teams and we worked 24 hours a day. Uh, it doesn't really get dark in Greenland at this time of year, but we still worked overnight. Um, and so what did we do? Well, we would get up every hour and we would measure the amount of meltwater that was running out of that lake and through that main river, traveling this way down into the Mulan, which was in, over here in the, the image that I showed you guys before. Um, and this, the amount of water running through this river at one time is called the river discharge. Now to measure discharge, we use what is called an acoustic Doppler profiler, um, which is this little cylindrical white instrument here that's, uh, that's attached to this, this black float, which might look kind of like, like a boogie board. We call it a hydro board. And, uh, and this acoustic Doppler current profiler, ADCP as it's sometimes called, um, measures the depth of the water and also how fast it's flowing. And we can add all that up to get a measurement of discharge. Um, and the reason it was important for us to measure discharge every hour is because, as you can see in this video, the river changes quite a bit during the day. It gets really high um, towards the end of the day, and then it drops really low 
uh, overnight and into the early morning. And then again, as you can see, this is you know over the course of more than a full day. Um, it never gets completely dark. The sun gets the sun gets low, and the river goes up and down and up and down. And we keep measuring it, but uh, but it doesn't get it doesn't get totally dark. So uh, so in order for us to know how much meltwater runs through the channel in one full day's time, we have to measure around the clock to make sure that we measure the river at all the different levels that it's at during the day. Um, uh, we also use an instrument like this, which is called a, a terrestrial laser scanner or a LIDAR, um, and it makes 3D maps of the ice surface. Uh, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. And, uh, and basically what it does is, is uh, this instrument spins around right here and it sends out uh, hundreds of thousands of little laser pulses uh, close together. And those laser pulses bounce off of the surface and return back to the instrument. And uh, we know how long it takes for them to, to shoot out from the instrument and bounce back to the instrument. And that time gets converted to a distance. And it produces maps that look like this. So these, these yellowish, orangish things are, are, are tents, which uh, I showed you guys before in, in the, on those images and those pictures. Uh, these are people right here. Um, this is the line that our, that our instrument that measures river discharge is attached to. Uh, so this person's operating that, moving that instrument back and forth across the river. Um, and the reason we, we collect data like this is we use it to measure how fast the ice surface is lowering as it melts. And we can then compare that to how much water is actually running through the river at one time. Um, at this camp, we also flew drones, and this drone has a has a digital camera on it. Um, not not that complex of a camera, maybe a little bit fancier than the ones in your cell phone, depending on what time of, type of cell phone you you, uh, you have. This is a photo of us launching this drone, um, and these drones take a bunch of pictures, picture after picture after picture, back to back, with very short time intervals between them. And we can later take all these pictures and stitch them together to make to map all the streams and rivers and lakes and different features on the ice that the that the drone flew over. So one picture from the drone might look like this. Uh, you can see a person down here for scale. Um, and again, it would take a lot of these photos and it would stitch all these photos together to map to map streams and lakes and rivers over large areas. And we also combine these drone images with satellite images. Um, in order to in order to map lakes and rivers on the ice surface over over areas much bigger than those that we can fly just with the drone. So this map here is roughly 120 miles long from from north to south down here. Uh, you can see that there's hundreds of streams and rivers and lakes just in this area. And we can use these maps to apply to apply what we learn at our one field site to much larger areas. So now that I've talked a little bit about what doing glacier hydrology research in Greenland is like and some of the challenges that, that we're faced with uh, when working on the ice, uh, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about why studying ice sheet hydrology is important. Um, but before I go there, I want to mention that there's a lot of reasons that ice sheet hydrology is important. But I'm just going to have time to talk about one of those reasons. Um, so if all of Greenland were to melt, it would rise sea level, it would raise sea levels from somewhere between six and seven and a half meters, which is on the 20 to 25 foot range. Um, and uh, recent work has found that by the end of this century, by 2100, um, about 80 years from now, Greenland might contribute as much as 33 centimeters or just over a foot to global sea level rise. Uh, this is a map from, from the NOAA sea level rise viewer. Um, this is New Orleans here and Florida over here. And uh, it, it demonstrates uh, one of the reasons that, uh, that sea level rise is important for us here in the United States. Um, these blue shades uh, estimate the, the water depth um, in different areas given, given 30 centimeters or just under a foot of sea level rise, which again is within, is within the range of what might happen from Greenland uh, by 2100. But how does the Greenland ice sheet actually contribute to sea level rise and, uh, and how is the research that we're doing fit into this? Um, well, it happens in two ways. Uh, first, for areas of Greenland where ice flows all the way to the ocean, um, where, it doesn't, where it doesn't come in contact with land, so for areas like this or like this or lots of little outlet glaciers over here, um, the ice can break or it can calve off of a glacier and create an iceberg that can float out into the ocean. Now, uh, types of losses like this, types of ice losses like this are called dynamical losses. 
Um, but as we have talked about before, the surface of the ice sheet can also melt. And this meltwater can flow on in through and under the ice sheet and eventually run off into the ocean. So we have two mechanisms or two ways by which the Greenland ice sheet can contribute to sea level rise. One is uh, one is to do calving and then icebergs like this here we see on the left, and the second is through uh, is through meltwater runoff to the ocean, like is shown in this picture here to the right. Um, and a recent study found that uh, that at least since the the 1970s, um, the Greenland ice sheet has raised sea levels by about 13 millimeters, and during this time, most of that loss most of those losses are due to, to dynamical losses from, from ice calving or breaking up, like here on like this photo here on the left. Um, but the fraction of total contribution to sea level rise from dynamical losses versus meltwater runoff uh, is, is shifting and it's changing. Um, some, some, more, some other recent work has found that, uh, that by 2100, only about 8 to 45% of the total sea level rise is, uh, will likely come from that dynamical losses from, uh, from calving and icebergs like this. That means that meltwater runoff from the Greenland ice sheet um, is, is increasingly the dominant mechanism by which the Greenland ice sheet contributes to sea level rise. Um, and this we know is expected to continue at least through 2100. So if we want to improve and refine our predictions of how fast sea levels are expected to rise, it is important to continue to study and understand how meltwater and the Greenland ice sheet is produced, how it transports across to and under the ice sheet, and how it's exported and ultimately makes its way to the ocean. Uh, so with that, I'll stop there.